Wake up, Riverside. It's time for announcements. I love Pop Park. We have a special outreach event just for you. On September 7th, we are renting out the theater over at Regal, 76 seats, and we are going to watch the movie called The Forge. It's a brand new Christian movie that's come out that is a follow-up of The War Room, if you've heard of that one. We want you to buy yourself a ticket and then buy a second ticket to invite somebody else. It's sort of an in-reach, outreach for Riverside Church. So if you will contact the church office, we will get you your ticket and we will go together and maybe make a difference and change somebody's life. Invite somebody to the movies. Get ready for a day of fun and community spirit. We're teaming up with the Kingdom Family Worship Center. We need enthusiastic volunteers to help with face painting and other exciting activities. It's a fantastic chance to make a difference, spread encouragement, and have a great time with your church family. Hey guys, if you haven't gotten the Riverside app yet, you need to do that today. Go to the App Store and download it on your phone. It's the one-stop shop for all things Riverside. You can give, you can sign up for events, all kinds of things. See our calendar, so go ahead and do that today. Riverside has several ways for you to give. You may wonder why we don't pass an offering plate. A lot of that stuff went away during COVID. But we have a QR code here that you can use to give, or you can give in one of our offering boxes. That's what I do. You can just give online. There are lots of ways to give. I encourage you to give to the church that you love, that is growing you and helping you spiritually. Come aboard with us financially. We invite you to join us for our upcoming Lunch and Learn, a Welcome Riverside class. This is the perfect opportunity to get to know us better and learn about Riverside. We believe that church is more than just a place to attend. It's a family to belong. Don't miss out. Register today for your next Lunch and Learn. Those walls that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose And those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave they were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came, and he died, and he rose. And those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross. The grave, let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took all breath away, face so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word, every whisper. Altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and he never will. Oh, this is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. That pit, he did, 
he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus and who pulled me out of that pit he did he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus who rescued me from that grave yahweh yahweh who gets the glory and praise come on nobody but jesus who rescued me from that grave yahweh yahweh who gets the glory and praise nobody but him this is our god Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is above and beyond. Mighty, majestic, awesome, abounding. Above and beyond. Um, so here we go. This, today we're going to talk about above and beyond faith. Faith. I've been, I've been thinking about this for a while, and, and then this week, you know, I was, I was uh, trying to pull all this, these notes together that I just have been taking for, and anyway, and then I was gone for a couple of days this week out, out of the state. And I thought, I'm never going to get this together, so I just planned something else. But as soon as I got back, it's like it all came together. So this is for you. Matthew 17, 20. The, the disciples uh, had, had failed in a, in, a, in a bit of a mission. So Jesus says, you don't have enough faith. And then Jesus said this, I tell you the truth, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing, nothing would be impossible. Luke 17, 5, Jesus revisits this. The apostles said to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. The Lord answered, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about mountain-moving faith. Practically everybody I know has a mountain, figuratively speaking, that needs to be moved. You know, you may have children that have no interest in Jesus. Like, how is that going to work? How is that going to happen? Or maybe you have an impossible situation in your family. Maybe a disease has entered into your body, and it's like, I don't know how this is going to uh, be resolved. Maybe you have a financial mountain in your life. Maybe there's somebody in some kind of an addictive lifestyle. Just what you consider maybe mountains, impossible situations. Maybe somebody who's just completely blind to the way of Jesus, and you don't know how they're ever going to change and then you can read a verse like this, and you might say, well, is this true? I mean, it doesn't really make sense. I don't really even see how this could work. I know God can do anything. We all know that, right? But we're, here's where we lack. I don't know if God will do anything. I think he can do. I don't know if he will do. And so in these verses, Jesus is telling his followers, he's actually making them a promise. He says, you can have something called mountain-moving faith, the kind of faith that makes impossible things possible. 
Now, I just want to tell you, this is not just a promise that Jesus makes these disciples. These disciples are soon going to realize that they're going to need this as a necessity in their life, not just something like the keep in the toolbox, like I'm going to need this every day, because they were up against some mountains. First of all, they were up against the mountain of the Jewish religion that that wanted to put down anything Jesus-related. They, they were up against the mountain of a Roman government that hated Christians and persecuted Christians. They were up against the mountain of persecution. And so when they looked to Jesus in that verse in Luke and said, hey, can you increase our faith? It was because the disciples, you know, they saw this faith thing as a link between Jesus and his father and getting works done. And so they're like, we need some of this faith, this fuel called faith. And so then Jesus answers with a rather wild illustration. He takes the biggest object that they would have known. So for the disciples, if you've ever been over to Israel, you know, there's mountains there, just rocky hills. And so, so he takes the biggest object that they would have known, this mountain over here, and then he takes the smallest object that might be known, which is a mustard seed. I have some up here this morning, just tiny little round seed. And Jesus actually says, see this small little tiny object? It can actually move that huge object. Now, many of the spiritual teachings of Jesus... It, uh, it, this, this doesn't make sense like, like many of those teachings. Like Jesus says one time, hey, the greatest in my kingdom will be the servant. Just doesn't seem to make sense. Or he says, the first will be last, and the last will be first. Doesn't make sense, you know, unless you study it out. Jesus says, you know, if you give, you are going to receive more back than you could ever give. And again, that doesn't make any sense. And now he says something else that doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, this little mustard seed right here, if you have faith this size, just this size, you can move a mountain. Now, there's no doubt that Jesus, while he was on this planet, recognized easily the faith of people. Sometimes he complimented faith. Sometimes he corrected faith. One time he met a, an army officer of the Roman army and and he was amazed at his faith because this officer believed that Jesus, if he would just say a word, his servant would be healed. And Jesus was like, well, man, this is, there's, I haven't met faith like this yet till I met this guy. In Mark chapter 5, there's a woman who reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. And Jesus is like, now that's a lot of faith. In Mark chapter 10, there was a blind man who, would not, who was in a crowd, and he kept yelling out, Heal me, Jesus. Have mercy on me, son of David. And, and Jesus is stirred by that and moves toward this man because of his faith. But Jesus is also amazed because there was lack of faith in people. Uh, he, one time he goes to his own hometown, and, and the people there, they knew who Jesus was. They knew about his works. They, they had heard all about these. They had seen it. But Jesus couldn't do many works there, it says in the Bible, because these people were so prideful and jealous of Jesus, like he's one of us, he shouldn't have these gifts, so they would never ask him, they would never reach out to him. And so there was a lack of faith. Uh, we learn in a story like that that there's things that can steal away faith in our life. Several times Jesus looked at the disciples and said, you have a lack of faith or you have a weak faith or your faith is faltering. And sometimes Jesus was in places where there was just no faith at all. Like when he wanted to raise Lazarus from the dead and he tells Martha and Mary, his sisters, like, that's what I'm going to do. I mean, that was so out of the realm of their thinking that they, they didn't have any faith at all. They just, they had faith in Jesus, but they didn't think that he was going to do that. I'm just glad, I'm just glad that, that, that we learn that even our weak faith and our faltering faith doesn't really stop what Jesus wants to do. Amen. I mean, remember when G Peter was walking on the water and all was well, you know, as he was trained upon Jesus? 
But then he started to sink because his faith got shaky. Like, I shouldn't be doing this. There's something weird going on here. And as he started to sink, do you remember what Jesus did? He didn't look down and go, too bad for you. But, but he, Jesus reached down and pulled him back up. Now, that, that, you know, Jesus knows that our faith is <laughs> not always solid. But I can confidently tell you this. That every single God story in the Bible involves this substance that we call faith. And Jesus is now telling his disciples, you know, if you can just get this little bit of faith, you can move the biggest object that stands in your way. Mountain moving faith. How does it work? So I want to take a few minutes and just unravel this, and then I want to tell you a couple stories at the end to illustrate how this works. So let's just start with defining what faith is. What is this mountain-moving faith? Well, we go to the definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, where it says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By this definition, I, wanna, I just want to bring out this to you, that all of us have faith. We all have faith in something. We all have a conviction about how things work, how we got here, why we're here, what we're supposed to be doing to, to live the good life. Everybody in this room is leaning on some truth somewhere in your life that you have faith in. We all have faith in something. But now we're going to talk about godly faith, because godly faith takes us to a better place, a whole nother realm, this mountain-moving realm, which we call the kingdom of God, where Jesus is ruling over life, where he is bringing his stuff into you, his peace, his power, his joy, his miracles, whatever it might be, he is working that. So in this definition of faith, in Hebrews 11, there's, there's three elements. The first element is the element of what he calls hope of unseen things. The first element of faith is, I have a hope. I am anticipating something up ahead. I have seen something in the future. I, I have a vision for something that can happen. Hope means that you see something that isn't present at the moment. This is an amazing thing that, that God gives us, this, this tool that we can imagine what isn't but what, what, but what will be. He downloads that into our hearts. We can see what isn't now but what will be. In, here, here's an example. We have five acres back out there. Now, some people, they go back there and they look, and all they see is grass and weeds, something to be mowed, and snakes crawling around. That's why you shouldn't walk around back there. But, but, there's some people that see something different. They see that five acres full one day of structures that are being used by God to do ministry in this community. So hope. The second part of faith in that verse is the word assurance. This means that you are sure that what you are hoping for is going to become a reality. The word assurance here is sort of an interesting word when you go back into the Greek language of the Bible. It means it is something that you are legally entitled to have. It's like a guarantee. It's like God has handed you the deed to the future and said, Hey, you've got it. You know, you saw it. You saw the hope. Now here's the deed telling you that it's going to happen. And then the third part of faith there is hope, assurance, and then conviction of things not seen. The word conviction means that you have an inner confirmation or an inner proof that you are convinced of the reality of what is coming. And because you have so much conviction of this, it enables you to weather the storms that are going to come to try to not let you get to that place. You have a conviction so deep that you are ordering your steps and your reality to getting 
to that place. So those are the, like the three parts of, of, of what faith is. I've seen something. I'm anticipating something. And that thing that I've seen, like it has claimed me. And I have claimed it. Like this is going to happen. And then the third part, I have been moved by this. And I'm moving toward it. And I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know it's going to happen in God's time. So faith, faith is my conviction that something invisible will become visible. Faith is my belief that what is not established right now is going to be established by the establisher who is God himself. Faith looks at nothing and sees something. Faith tells me that what isn't will be. Faith tells me that what, what won't happen will happen. Faith tells me that what couldn't can. Faith tells me that what shouldn't shall. Faith tells me that what can't be will be. Faith hears what nobody else hears. And faith feels what nobody else is, is feeling. Faith is, is walking and working toward a destination that nobody else sees But we have the conviction that that destination is going to be there once we arrive in that place. Faith is not something that you possess, really, but it is something that possesses you. Faith is something that enables you to reach up into the heavenly places and pull down the riches of God right into our earthly situation. Faith is the evidence that I own something that I don't actually own yet, but I'm about to own. Or as Tony Evans always says, faith is believing it is so when it's not so because God said so, and so it will be so. If you want to know what faith does, faith is what caused you, if you are a follower of Jesus, Faith is what caused you to reach back 2,000 years ago to a part of the world you may have never been in, to a man you have never seen, to a cross that you didn't witness, and, and, and you, but yet your faith is, you've reached back to that moment in time, to that death and resurrection of Jesus, and you grabbed a hold of that, and it has changed your life. And now... Now you are willing to base your entire life that that event is the event, the true event of the world, and you are basing your life upon that event. Faith is what does that. There's something about faith. There's something about faith. Faith is what dares you to step out of the boat. Faith is is what causes you to do things no one else is doing. Faith is what causes you to walk into a lion's den without fear. Faith is what causes you to to bring blessing to other people after you've been blessed. Faith is what allows you to experience God's glory. Faith is what causes you to, to dare to do dangerous things. Faith is what got Peter out of the boat. Faith is why Barnabas sold everything and gave it to the Lord. Faith is what caused Peter and John to tell a crippled man one day to get up and walk in the name of Jesus. Faith is what caused Joshua to circle around Jericho until the walls fell down. Faith is what caused David to take on Goliath. Faith is why Moses shows back up in Egypt after leaving it 40 years before. Faith causes you to go where others won't go. Faith is what causes you to pray what others are afraid to pray. Faith is what causes you to trust when others desert. Faith is what causes you to believe that nothing is impossible with God. We are the followers of Jesus, so we walk by faith. So this little saying that we have in the church, let's see what God can do, that is faith right there. That's the DNA of faith. But there's a second part of faith. How do I get this? Where does it come from? How can I get more of it? That's what the disciples ask. Increase our faith, Jesus. Well, here we go. Here's how you get it, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word. Uh, There's a Greek word right there. It's called rhema, through the word of Christ. You know, I've played a lot of sports in my life, and something that is pretty common in sports is sometimes... We have a far superior team, and we're playing a lesser team, and we know that we should win this game. We know we can win the game. So what? But 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 
we just fool around. We fool around. And then we think at the end of the game, well, we're going to just turn it on right now. We're going to turn it on. We're going to win this game because we're so much better. And then when you go to try to turn it on, guess what? You can't. It's like everything's, you're so used to playing at a half a level, you can't just bring your level up. And then you lose. You lose the game. Some people think faith is like that. I could just get it when I need it. I could just turn it on when I need it. Or I could just go up to, you know, like I'm going to just go to the faith store and buy some, you know. Or some people, it's like I'm just going to work up some faith. Maybe if I pray a little louder, you know, the, the, there's going to be more faith. But Romans 10, 17 here really tells us where faith comes from. And, and, and again, I'm going to break this down into three parts. The first thing it tells us is that faith really comes from Jesus. Because faith is from Jesus, but faith is for Jesus. There's no mountain-moving faith without Jesus. Faith comes by hearing. And what are you hearing? You're hearing the word of Christ. And that word of Christ is all about Christ. It's not about you. It's about Christ. And, and the central object of where all faith comes from is Jesus. Faith is always connected to Jesus. Anytime that there's great faith in Scripture, it's because people had a great understanding of who Jesus was and a great connection. They saw the glory of Jesus, and they suddenly realized, this man can do anything, and so let's ask him. If, if you tell me that you're going to cross the ocean and you get in a rowboat, I'm going to plan your funeral. That's the way it's going to be. But some people, that's all they have. Their faith is in a rowboat Jesus. you got a mountain to be moved, but you're in a rowboat. You need a bigger Jesus. Now, if you want to cross the ocean, you say, I'm getting on you know, the, a cruise liner, I'll... I'll I'm a little more happy for you. We need, a lot of us need a bigger Jesus. But faith always has an object. And for us, for Christians, faith is in who Jesus is. But secondly, in this verse, it tells us something about faith. Faith comes through hearing the word of God. So mountain-moving faith comes from hearing from God. Now, the reason I put that Greek word in that verse is because the word rhema doesn't mean you just, it's not just any word that you're hearing. Uh, this is a word from God. This doesn't mean you just read the Bible. It's not that kind of a word. That is called a logos word. Uh, that's the Greek interpretation. The word rhema means that you read the Bible and suddenly you go, that's it. God just spoke to me. Like something just came out of that page and grabbed a hold of my heart. This is what he's talking about. Faith comes when God speaks. For instance, you know, maybe you've been reading through the Bible and you read many, many words, many chapters, and then all of a sudden there's that one word, that one passage, that one verse, that one idea, that one act, that one story, and it inflames your heart and you go, I think I can get through this now. That is God speaking to you. You know, sometimes people ask me this question, Pastor, like, where do your messages come from? And, and, and I'll be honest, they come through the speaking of, of God into my heart, like this is what you need to do. This is where we need to go with this, this stuff. Here's another example of, of a living word. Um, I love, you know, to pray for healing for people. But let's be honest, not many people anymore ask to be prayed for for healing, which befuddles me because God is happy to do it. But here's why I love to pray for healing, because one day I'm reading Mark chapter 1, and there's this story about this leper who comes to Jesus, and he says to Jesus, you can heal me if you will. And what did Jesus say back? He said, I will. Now, I have to tell you, one day I read that story, and my whole perspective of God's healing power changed in my life. Because I read those words, I will, and I just suddenly realized Jesus wants to do this. 
Jesus wants to move in people's hearts. And all of a sudden, that word got inflamed inside of my heart. And I thought, you know what? I want to pray for people to be healed because God, Jesus said, I will to a leper one day. Now, here's the weird part about that. If I'm praying for you, but you don't even ask to be prayed for, you know, you come limping in here with something going on, and you don't even ask to be prayed for, I'm not really sure how that works. Like, does my faith overcome your resistance to even be asked? I, I don't know about all that. But it would be really nice if you would just say, you know what, I, I, I want to be prayed for. And then maybe somebody like me or somebody else in this church could use whatever faith they have on your behalf. But what Romans 10 says is that faith comes through hearing the word of God. When God speaks to you, suddenly you will have this mountain-moving faith. And believe me, God wants to speak to you. You know, here's other ways it works. If you're a generous giver, you're a generous giver because you heard the word of the Lord one day say to you, you're not losing anything when you give, and suddenly you started giving. If you are a follower of Jesus, the only reason you're a follower of Jesus is because one day God spoke to your heart. It says in Ephesians, you, know, you are saved by grace through faith. I mean, God spoke to you, ignited in you this desire to follow him. If you're a teacher of children, you're a teacher of children, hopefully not because somebody guilted you into it, but because one day you heard the word of God, a fresh word from Jesus saying to you, you know what, these kids, they need to know me. So go in there with your mountain-moving faith and teach them about me. And so you acted according to that word, and then they were blessed, and you were blessed, and you've never run out of love. You've never run out of messages. You've never run out of patience. You've never run out of anything as you've served him. I remember one day I heard a fresh word from the Lord way, way back that said, Brian, I want you to go into full-time vocational ministry. And I followed that word, and it's one of the best decisions I've ever made. But faith comes from the fresh words of the Lord. And when you get a fresh word from the Lord, what used to be untrue in your life, now you're going, I think that can be true. And what you couldn't see before, now you're going, I can, I can see that happening. What you used to be unwilling to try, now you're going, I think I'm going to try that. Where you used to be unwilling to go, now you will go because you've heard a fresh word from the Lord. A fresh word. So let's understand something about the fresh words of, that God is giving us. God is giving you words for things he wants to happen in this world or in your life. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't just speak for the heck of it. He gives you words that ignite faith for things he wants to do. Faith is not some trick that we use to manipulate God to do what we want. Fresh words from God is what we need. And by the way, his words are never going to contradict or have conflict with the written word of God. Never going to happen that way. Now, I will be honest and tell you there's a few times in my life I thought I heard a fresh word from God. And I should have tested it a little bit more because they weren't from God. And that comes to the third part of Romans 10. It says, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing this fresh word from God. But notice the first two words, faith comes. Faith comes. If you want an increase of faith, mountain-moving faith, the kind of power that brings God down, then you have to be in a place where you are hearing from God. Now, I'm hearing from everybody these days, right? You too. I'm hearing, hey, the stock market, be very scared, it's very volatile, you're going to lose everything. I'm hearing on the news that the world is burning to pieces right now. I'm hearing from politics that this person is going to be the savior we need. I'm hearing from the devil that I shouldn't trust God and God probably doesn't like me anyway. I'm hearing from the doctors that maybe there's an incurable disease. I, I hear all kinds of things every single day, but here's my challenge. What are you hearing from God? What is the word of the Lord saying? And God is not stingy about giving his word to you if you want it. 
He is very liberal when it comes to giving away his words. But you have to be listening, and you have to put yourself in a place where you can hear from him. Faith comes by hearing. What are you hearing? Are you in a place where you can hear from God? And if you haven't heard from God, then you can't really have mountain-moving faith. If you're not convinced of the power and glory of Jesus, you can't have mountain-moving faith. Because you know what? You can't move any mountains. Only Jesus can. And Jesus is only interested in moving the mountains that he wants moved in the first place. Now, let me give you a, a Bible story here and bring this together. Do you remember Abraham of the Old Testament? Now, here's something you probably may not know, but, but he had mountain-moving faith. I mean, his faith was so great, it moved the entire planet Earth. So a little bit about Abraham. Abraham grew up in a very secular and pagan culture. His, his family were idol worshipers. He was one of them. But when God wants to do a brand new work in the world, for some reason, he picks Abraham, and he finds Abraham, and he speaks to Abraham. We'll, we'll read what he spoke to Abraham here in a moment. But Abraham literally has changed the planet Earth. Judaism came from Abraham, which began the change. And then Jesus came from Judaism. And then all Christians came from there. And all of this has changed the planet. But Abraham had nothing more than a mustard seed of faith. Let me give you this story. God appears to uh, Abraham in Genesis 12.1, and he says to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So Abraham went as the Lord told him. So you see all the aspects of faith right there? God gives him a vision of hope. Abraham soaks it in. He hears this fresh word of the Lord, and he's convicted I have heard from God. And so he just does what God says. It's as simple as that. Genesis 15, 3. Abraham is sort of arguing with God because he says, you're going to make a great nation out of me? I don't even have any kids. And so look what happens here. Genesis 15, 3. Abraham said, behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my own household will be my heir. And behold, the word, a fresh word of the Lord came to him, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. There is no son. So God is giving him a vision of the future right there. In verse 5, And he brought him outside and he said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to them, So shall your offspring be. And what did Abraham do? He believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is mustard seed faith. Abraham hears from the Lord. Abraham makes a move. Abraham then one day says to the Lord, I, I'm not sure how you're going to do this. The Lord speaks to him again, gives him a new, fresh word. And then one of the most famous verses of the whole Bible, verse 6, he, what, Abraham just said, I believe you. And God says, because you believe me, all is right. You are right with me. All is right. Everything is going to come just as I said it was going to come. Now, this doesn't look like a whole lot, does it? This looks rather simple. I mean, Abraham as a man is just sort of a mustard seed. In fact, Abraham's going to die, and he's not even going to see all that God promised him. But what Abraham did do is he said, well, I'm going to do what you said, Lord. And so he simply steps out, and he says, I believe everything you say. Planting a mustard seed seems simple enough. God is not asking you for anything big or flashy. He's simply asking you, do you believe I can do this? Will you make a move to trust me and stop trusting everything you're hearing and trusting yourself? You know, sometimes we think faith is just all about an instantaneous thing that happens in a moment. But here's the deal about mustard seeds. You plant a mustard seed, and it's just going to grow. If I plant a tree in my front yard... And then I move away, does the tree go, well, he moved away, I'm not growing anymore. Or if I die, does the tree go, well, he's gone. 
No, it keeps on growing. And this is the thing about mustard seed faith. Even if you're not here, it keeps on growing. Even though Abraham died, it kept on growing and growing and growing and growing. That is the power of faith. Now, I don't know what your mountain is today, but I do know what Jesus said. And Jesus said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, if you have the smallest belief that I can do it, then I can move that mountain for you. Your decision has to just be this. God, I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to do it your way. Just, Lord, you've spoken to me today, and I want to lay this down. And then God will take it from there. Faith is not a magic potion to get God to do what you want him to do. Faith is given by God to show you God's future. And then God says, I want you to partner with me to get to that place. And you know what? That future can be as big as you can see in your life. Now, here's what we're going to do to, to finish this, this, this service today. I've put up here on the platform, you'll see little foam bowls. And they have mustard seeds in them. And I'm just thinking that somebody here today just needs to say, you know, I can believe you, Lord. I don't know how it's all going to happen exactly, but I can trust you. And what I would like you to do is, there's a card. The card has a, a saying on it that says, my mustard seed faith to move this mountain. You can write on that line of the card what your mountain is today. And then I'd like you to take a mustard seed or a couple of them if you want because they're very small. Put a piece of tape on that mustard seed and just tape it to that card. We're doing arts and crafts this morning. And, uh, but you could take this home just as a reminder. You know, today I gave this to the Lord. I believe that God will do what I cannot do. I have faith in my great Savior. So, they're all up here as Vince uh, leads us in our last song. I want to say thank you to Vince because little did you know, Steve had COVID on Tuesday. Jennifer had COVID on Friday. And that's why Vince, is he just stepped right up and took over the music today. So thank you for that. But this morning, if you want to do some arts and crafts, come up, make a commitment whatever that mountain is, and just say, I'm just like Abraham. I believe you, Lord. I believe you can do this. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. How amazing that you said that our smallest action to trust you can result in a mountain being moved. And Lord, we all come in with the impossible situation in our life that we know we can't handle on our own. Today, could we just give this to you and, and see you extend your hand and raise it up. Give us faith in Jesus' name. So come, let's stand. Come as the Lord leads you and do your thing.